Hello, and welcome to the Foxworthy TV Podcast, episode number eight. I'm Brian Fox, one of your two hosts. I'm here with my friend Taylor Gaines. Hello. Who writes for GainesvilleScene.com. And today we are going to be talking about a bit of a touchy subject for people who like TV. We're going to be talking about some network shows that you may or may not have watched. Um, it also may be a touchy subject for people who are protective of TV not becoming the movies. That is fair. Which we'll that get is totally to in fair. a second. So, let's jump right in here. Today we're going to talk about uh, CBS's Supergirl pilot, which just aired last night. Uh, Monday night, we're recording on Tuesday. And then we're going to touch on um, some Fox comedies, specifically the new Rob Lowe, Fred Savage co-starring comedy, The Grinder. <laughs> the Grinder. Four episodes of that. Four episodes in to The Grinder. Um, So let's dive in and talk about um, Supergirl and what we liked and maybe didn't like about it. Um, Taylor, do you want to tell the people what your general feelings were about Supergirl? I didn't think I was going to like Supergirl. That's totally fair. And I liked it. On a scale scale from 1 to 10. Why did I like it? How much did much did you like it? Um, Maybe compared to what you thought you would like it. Compared to what I thought, like an 8. But realistically, probably like a six or seven. Yeah. Um, there were... Th- I, I have three reasons why I think that this worked. And I'll, I'll, I'll tease them a little bit in case people just want to hear all three and, and not hear me drag it out for a while. But basically, because it's not Man of Steel. Um, totally fair. Because uh, Melissa Benoist is great. And because the... Oddly enough, like, the girl power of it was kind of appealing. Mm-hmm. Um, and For it, sure. did, it didn't feel forced, really. I mean, it just kind of is in the DNA of the character. But anyway, I want to get back to that first point, because that was the my number one reason why I think I enjoyed it, was Man of Steel is probably one of my least favorite movies of the last, like, five years. In general, or just in, like, the superhero genre? De- well, definitely in the superhero genre, but also in the sense of, like, a movie I was excited to see and then just despised. Um, I don't know if it's... It's not, like, a, a bad movie, but, like, it was a, it was really not what I was hoping it would be. Right. Um, and I think for me, personally, the main reason for that is that when I think of Superman, I think of kind of... The smiling American hero in the blue skies, and like he's just saving the day, and everybody's everybody loves him. Um, but the the approach that uh, Zack Snyder and Co. took was very dark, mm-hmm. and like, what would it be like if Superman came in twenty fifteen? And it, like, that's an interesting idea, but like, for me, it just didn't feel like the DNA of that kind of character. Right, and it was joyless and humorless for the most part. Right. It was maybe one, Basically, jo- one joke that landed in the whole I didn't enjoy movie. being there at all. Right. And Supergirl was just really fun. Like, the the tone was much lighter and like, breezier. I don't mm-hmm. know. Like, Absolutely. Like, she's, ex- she's just excited to save people. Like, that was one of my favorite moments is when in the pilot... I guess we'll get into some slight pilot mm-hmm. spoilers, but there it's pretty much what you would expect for a superhero pilot. Right. So she starts off and um, winds up saving a plane from crashing, which is the first time she's flown in a long time and the first time she has really saved people. But then she goes home and she's sitting on her couch watching the news and they are talking about her saving the plane. Obviously, they don't know it's her. And she just kind of is bouncing on the couch with excitement. She's just like, this is so fun. Like, this is what I was born to do. And just that sense of enjoyment was something that Man of Steel did not have and something yeah. that made this way more appealing to me. Yeah. Did, did you have Man of Steel thoughts? or What did well, you, think? What did you well, think of the tone of this? For, for long-time listeners of the podcast, there was an early episode I did, um, a much longer episode with my friend Malik Grady, who is um, a comics enthusiast, and we did a 
semi-long segment about what I didn't like about Man of Steel and how I thought that maybe these this new DC crop of movies that's coming, that's a whole other conversation, but, you know, the Batman versus Superman movie is coming, and it basically looks like more of Man of Steel. So, um, as far as Supergirl goes, um, I, the first five minutes were kind of awful, I'll just be honest, like, the first, like, five minutes were, like, Exposition, 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 like, let's just give you a bunch of information, and I understand that setting things up is, like, important, especially if people don't know anything about Supergirl as a comic, but I also kind of feel like it just would have been so much better and so much stronger an episode without that whole beginning, like, that first, because they they didn't draw it out, which I appreciated, because it wasn't just, the whole thing wasn't just an origin story about, like, how she got to Earth, and how this, and she's related to Super... Like, it literally starts with her just narrating, and, like, the first five minutes is, like, just basically gets you up to speed to present day, which I appreciated that, but then the piece that she gave us was just super, like, kind of cheesy and, like very just rushed through, like, doesn't really give you much to hold on to. And would the show have even been appreciably different if it had just started with her walking through New York City, no. talking on her phone? No, it would have been better. Like, I definitely think it would have been better. I don't, yeah, I don't even think the, the beginning part was really necessary. Um, especially... Especially since they make several references throughout to, like, her famous cousin, Superman. Right. Although they only, I think they only used the phrase Superman once, Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, they. Do. I mean, it's clear who they're talking about. Right. But anyway, I kind of, to be honest with you, like, as a whole, the episode, like, I was really entertained by it, and I thought Melissa Benoist, as we discovered, that's how you say her name, um, she is, was terrific, I thought. Very charming. Very, yeah, I mean, very you watchable. About, you talked about that, like, bad first five minutes, mm-hmm. and... When, as soon as she showed up on the screen, I basically would just started smiling. I was just yep. like, she's great. Like, I just, yeah. like, want to be friends with her. But, I'll say this, throughout the episode, I kind of went back and forth between, like, oh, this is really fun, like, I could watch this, this is really light and entertaining, and, like, I'm just, like, enjoying it. And then there were moments that I was just like, okay, this is, this is awful. What kind it's of like moments? like, I kind of, just, like, there was just moments where, like, things got really cheesy and, like, really sappy, which is expected, but at the same time, I feel like it was too much so, and there was, it's... It's CBS was showing, I'll say that, <laughs> at, uh, at moments. But I thought the production value, I don't know if it'll continue, because I know that they usually blow a lot of money on pilots and then kind of right. temper the temper the budget for, for future episodes. But um, I thought, as far as CBS goes, like I've never seen anything that looked this good on CBS. I mean, the plane sequence was like, yeah, I mean, it was clearly like effects driven, but like, Pretty good as far as TV, TV goes, like pretty good effects. Like it was better really looking, believable. It was better looking than uh, Daenerys from Game of Thrones flying on a dragon a few months ago. Oh really? Which I know you haven't seen, but huh. it's like the grand reveal of her flying on her dragon, and it looked horrible. Oh really? Um, huh. At least you know the the plane thing looked better than that. But yeah, I mean, so, yeah. see, I I didn't mind the uh, general cheesiness of it as much because I felt like that was just part of its part of its DNA. Just, right. I was like, that's what Superman's, that's what's, that's what Supergirl should be, is like cheesy and like over the top and right. kind of just enjoyable. Um, instead of over the top destruction and sadness, mm-hmm. which is what I feel when I think of Man of Steel. Mm-hmm. But, I don't know, I just really enjoyed this so much more than I expected to. And I just, we talked about Melissa Benoist and how we've been a fan of her because she's in Whiplash. Yeah. Which Before I we think... started recording, we had to we had to explain <laughs> that she she's in one of basically the best movie of 2014. Let's just put that out there. Yeah, I think I referenced last week that Whiplash and Mad Max are basically the only two movies I would like to watch every day for the rest of my life. The only thing that currently holds your attention as far as movies. <laughs> yeah, that's how we, that's how we go. described it. And we teased Supergirl, I think, and still neglected to mention the connection between Whiplash and yeah. Supergirl. Um, but yeah, like, how do you... I'm trying to think of a concrete way to describe, like, why she was good, but I'm not totally she sure how. Just kind of, she just kind of has just a charm, and just, like, she just feels like 
I don't know, to me, she feels very much like someone I might know. And, like, she just feels very, like, amiable. And, like, like you said, like, there's just, like, kind of a joy to the way that she accepts her role as, like, a hero of... What is the city that they're in? Uh, Was it National City? Victory? National City? Which... Is that a thing? I don't... I, I'm sure I've it's never a thing. I've never heard that in, as far as DC Comics go. I've never heard that. See, I didn't that even that's... know that Supergirl has been a thing since, like, the 50s. Yep. So, yeah, it's National City. Um, yeah, so National City, which I learned last night, because I honestly did not know that that was, like, a fictional city in the DC universe. But I think you just touched on I, what what is refreshing and great about her as Supergirl, um, is that sense of someone who's excited to be a hero right. and have superpowers and not be, like, burdened with the weight of the world for being a hero. Because mm-hmm. it's kind of a cool thing, like... Sure, it'll be hard to be a hero because you kind of yeah. have to fight crime and go face all this evil. But there's obviously a part of it that is joyful and you'll enjoy. And I don't know why so many movies and maybe TV shows, but I haven't watched as many superhero TV shows. I don't know why so many of them have a, the need to make being a hero seem only like a burden and not like any joy right. whatsoever. Well, we're going to get to some other comic book TV shows in just a minute, just in terms of a comparison and talking about this boom of sort of comic adaptations coming to television. But um, a couple more things I wanted to to cover as far as the Supergirl pilot goes. What was your general feeling whenever they they <laughs> they basically explained that she, when she came out of the Phantom Zone, she dragged this like alien prison down to Earth, right? And there's, like, this secret government organization that's, like, hunting down these, cri- like, alien criminals or whatever. And they literally have a sheet with all these people's faces on it. And my th- immediate thought was, oh, this is where it becomes a CBS procedural. She's going to have to take down one of these aliens from the prison, like, every week. Did you get that feeling? What feeling? Just that That, that it's, that like, oh, annoying. here's the setup for, like, this is a CBS procedural right. that's, like, disguised as a... Well comic book show i don't hate that because i knew what i was i knew what channel i was watching i don't know like i i kind of saw that and was like oh okay that's how they're gonna make this be a weekly like work on cbs yeah um but they also kind of hinted that it will be at least somewhat of a bigger picture thing because at the end they right reveal that someone is a villain who's masterminding the whole thing now quick aside from what I know, from what I understand, reading the internet last night, apparently we were we were supposed to know who that person was, and know that it wasn't Superman's mom, but it's someone else's mom. What do you mean? Well, because she keeps saying, "Oh, even if it's my niece, I'll have to go after her." So, like, my first impression, not knowing anything about the comics, was like, "Is that like Superman's mom? Like, is because she's his cousin, and if Superman's right. her niece." Then who is this person? But does she die? Doesn't she die? In like the mythology of Superman, doesn't like I don't know. Jor- it doesn't Ellen. matter. I mean, it's it's interesting. <laughs> We're, this is clearly not like our forte. Like I'm definitely more of a Marvel guy myself. But anyway, um, the point is that I don't hate the procedural element of it, and really the reason that I enjoyed it was the the tone and the mm-hmm. Melissa Benoist in the center of it. So if I were to watch more, which I'm sure I'll watch a couple more, um, just to see what it's like week to week, but it would be because of her and because of the kind of fun of it, because the the villain of the week was kind of the most forgettable part of the thing. Right. Um, Well, and that's what concerns me about this potentially being their route for the procedural thing is that aside from the overarching story that they might be doing with, like, the twist of the, spoiler alert, the twist of the um, evil aunt. I guess that's a, I should have said spoiler alert already. (laughs) Spoiler alert. Where'd it go? It's here. Anyway. Um, Yeah, it's... Aside from that and maybe some bigger narrative elements, I think that, um, I just think that the procedural part, like, just isn't necessary. But it's on CBS, so I think that that's just kind of in their DNA to, like, we got to make sure that, like, people can come each week and just enjoy random episodes. And I feel like those Villain of the Week things are going to just be 
basically really generic and boring, like they were in this pilot. Like, that was by far the weakest part of the pilot. Um, let's talk really quick, just to get this, because I think this is definitely important, and a lot of people are talking about it in this way. Um, when this trailer came out, this there was, like, some four-minute reel that they released or whatever, and people were kind of rolling their eyes. Some people thought it looked amazing, and other people were kind of rolling their eyes saying, like, oh, this is, like, the the Black Widow SNL thing where it was like if they made a Black Widow movie it would have to be a romantic comedy basically saying that like you can't right. just have a female being a badass um, as a superhero uh, you know so do you feel like that trailer do you know what I'm talking about does, I saw do you feel like that trailer represents what the show is I don't think it I, felt now like a people, romantic comedy because now people are basically kind of flipping their opinion and a lot of people online are saying oh well this is a terrific like feminist superhero well, show yeah i mean and, let's be honest you shouldn't decide what something's message is based off its trailer right that's just unfair but i think the yeah this is the other thing i wanted to talk about was the feminist i guess mm -hmm. aspect of this um because it was definitely like, refreshing, I guess, to to just have a cast where I think three of the four, three of, like, the five or six main characters we were introduced to were prominent women. Mm -hmm. And the two main characters seem to be uh, Kara slash Supergirl and, and her, her cousin or sister, half her sister, step, whatever. Well, it's the sister that she was raised with because she goes to live just like Superman does. She goes to live with like a normal human family. And like, it's like her human sister that has no biological like relationship to her, but right. they grew up and together. The show isn't subtle. Mm -hmm. Like there's the woman in the diner who's like, isn't it great that my daughter has someone to look up to? And you're just, like, it's not right. subtle, but it's also not, Something that a lot of shows do because Correct. there's not a lot of female superheroes and there's not a lot of right or female driven female, television. Yeah, in general. Um, <clears throat> so it was just cool, like especially because, like we talked about, Melissa Benoist is charming and like right. you want to root for her, so you like like to see that other people are looking up to her and um, that she kind of represents something bigger. Um, was it a little ham-handed at times with how, like, overt, overtly feminist it was? Like, yeah, a little bit. But it wasn't... Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that was necessarily to the detriment of the show, though. I don't think so, either. Um, and I thought the little monologue about naming her Supergirl was mm -hmm. interesting. I don't know if... Um, yeah, part of me wonders if that's ever been tackled in the comics... Right. Like, I, I don't know if they've ever addressed that specifically, basically calling her the, Supergirl instead of Superwoman. Right, and the gist of this monologue was basically, I'm a girl, and I'm rich and powerful and attractive, and I'm perfectly fine with it, um, so why should she not be called Supergirl? And I, I don't that's know her if... That's her boss's reaction, right? Right. Yeah. And I don't know if women in general or, like, feminists uh, would agree with that little monologue, but, like... Within the context of the show, I was like, oh, that seems like that would make sense. But I'm also not a woman, or right. a, I'm not a female, so... Um, I don't know if, if females don't like being referred to as girls in, mm. in general, but I thought that that aspect of the show worked. I, um, yeah, for sure, I agree too. And, and going off of that, I guess this is kind of a good way to segue into um, some of the other things going on in the other comic book corners of the TV universe... Um, another show that, um, this is, you say that it's refreshing, but it's also hopefully going to become a trend, um, because Agent Carter on ABC, which is a spinoff of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and taking place in the Marvel Universe, like, female-centered lead, um, you know, it got, it's really popular, popular enough that it got a second season, so that's at least two shows, and I know that there's multiple characters on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. that are female, that are leading roles, that are just there to be badasses. Um, I haven't watched that show since season one, but what is your relationship to sort of this genre of television? You haven't seen very many of these comic book shows, or...? Um, probably Daredevil. 
is the it's only, the only one, one that I've watched at, right. at all, maybe. I, I was going to say all the way through, but I don't think I've even... I haven't seen Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Agent Carter or Arrow or The Flash. Um, that's pretty much all of them, right? Yeah. I, I, don't, I haven't well, really Con- seen Constantine any was on NBC, but it got canceled. Um, and, I, I mean, I'll probably be watching Jessica Jones, which is coming soon. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I think that... As a entertainment consumer, I've seen a lot of the Marvel movies and the DC movies, and I thought, well, these are all fine. <laughs> so, and the TV versions don't look that much more attractive to me, where there's just so much stuff on TV that I do want to watch um, that I just haven't really made much of an effort to. Right. Seek out comic book stuff. I'm also not really a comic book person, so um, that's part of it. But mm-hmm. I think that's where you and I differ a little bit, just in our in, in terms of our interest level in this type of show. I think if they're going to be really, really well done, um, I'm, I'm going to be on board because, especially with the Marvel stuff, because like I watched the first season of Agents of Shield, which was pretty problematic for a while, but then they kind of figured it out in the last half. And I haven't gotten to see any of the second or season or the current season that's on, but apparently it's done nothing but just get better and better and better and better. And I think that I'm not the probably not the first person to say this. I know I'm not the first person to say this, but in a lot of ways it seems like just the comics medium is better suited to a television show than it is to a movie. Right. And basically what Marvel's doing, I talked about this before, um, referencing that other podcast that I did with my friend Malik Grady, where we talked about comic books for, like, almost two hours. Um, Basically, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where they have all these interlocking movies, is basically just TV on a larger scale. So it is very interesting that TV is is kind of... There's this boom in TV of these comic book shows, because I think, you know, having bringing in different villains each season or each week... Oh. Here's one we forgot to mention that we both don't watch anymore. I just thought of this too. Gotham. Gotham. Which nope. and can't same say it. reason why I didn't like Man of Steel, honestly. The I mean, they tried at times to be lighter on Gotham, but it's just like so dark and and just vil- it's I don't even have words. <laughs> I don't have words. Yeah, anymore. I mean, I'm I, I'm I'm out on Gotham. I think we both agree like I I watched the whole we watched the whole first season and it it didn't it didn't really do much for me. Um, it started out pretty good, but... But, I mean, we mentioned Daredevil. I think it's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, Daredevil... I, I liked it's... Daredevil. I thought Daredevil mm-hmm. was good, but uh, part of me watching Supergirl last night really appreciated that she was in the suit in, like, 20 minutes. Right. Like, she already had the suit done and was flying around in it, like, 20 minutes. Basically, sp- spoiler alert, this is a major spoiler. Spoiler. Also, just skip, like... 15 seconds if you yeah. don't want to know what happens in Daredevil. But the f- reveal of the whole season is him putting on the suit, basically. I mean, yeah, essentially. <laughs> anyway, moving on, because that will be 15 seconds or so. Um, you can un- you can unpause, unspoil, <laughs> unskip. <clears throat> so, I think we can uh, probably move on, right? Right, so is there any kind of final point we want to just put a pin in this conversation? Um, do, do you think this is a problem that this is, like, taking off? Or do you okay, think it's yeah. just... Um, no. Just the way things are going? And I'm, I'm, I'm stealing Andy Greenwald's point from his column about Supergirl last week. But I think his point is very comforting if people are actually worried that comic book TV is taking over. Um, as John Landgraf pointed out, and we've mentioned on this podcast, president of FX... Mm-hmm. There's more than, like, 400 scripted shows this year. Right. Having 10 of them be superhero shows does not mean superhero shows are taking over television. It just means they're part of this era of too much television. Mm -hmm. And it's good, because that means there's something for everybody out there. So, that's my takeaway. I mean, that's fair. And I definitely think there's some that are good and some that are not, and there's a bit of a disparity between... There's definitely, you know, a major difference between something as as solidly made and as as good and interesting as Daredevil and something like Gotham. So, you know, there's there's going to be different, you know, levels to it. But 
I think we'll be revisiting Supergirl at some point. I I definitely think maybe I'll watch a few more and see, you know, maybe if just, it can keep yeah. this keep to this decide what, just it's, enjoyment what it's like up. on a week to week basis. Right. Cuz pilots are always hard to tell, but um so yeah, speaking of um network television, um we're going to take a shift here and talk about strangely Fox became kind of like a home for like <laughs> good pretty decent comedies. Comedy? Which, I don't really know how that shift happened, but it seems yeah, like so, most enjoyable comedies that I'm into right now are all on Fox. Yeah, I mean, I want to talk about The Grinder specifically, right. but we should mention this at least quickly. Like, Sunday nights, I believe I have regularly been watching Bob's Burgers, Last Man on Earth, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and on Tuesdays I watch The Grinder. Um, does Empire count as a comedy? <laughs> I, I mean, watch Empire. Um, At least I do now. But anyway, the and I kind of enjoy all those shows on varying levels. I right. think Brooklyn Nine Nine is probably the best of them. I love Brooklyn um, Nine Nine. I did a I fully endorse it. Halloween episode this week that was really funny. It was so good. Um, Such a great episode. And I can tell you, I I just started watching Brooklyn Nine Nine this season. I haven't seen more than this season. So if you really want to watch it, just watch this season. I mean, I'd yeah. like to go back and watch more, but at the time, like, it's fine to just watch. Yeah, no, you can definitely um, jump in on Brooklyn Nine-Nine at any point. And but, I highly recommend it. Yeah, but as so, far as new shows go, um, the I would say, yeah, The Grinder. Now, I guess we should preface this by saying, from what I understand, Episode 4 was the last one the original showrunner worked on. Yes, right? from what I've researched, that seems to be the case. So basically, they shot four episodes ish, and they had one showrunner, which is my understanding is the creators that are have, have are create are. <clears throat> let me take this back. That are credited with creating the show um, are still involved. So the creators that um, weekly come up on the credits are still involved, but the showrunner who was like running the whole overall show, he quit or had some sort of disagreement with whoever and ditched after four episodes. And we've now, they have now aired four episodes of The Grinder. Right. So, so we be might have to revisit to see, this. Right. It'll be interesting to see if there's some kind of shift in tone or style or if it remains as sharp and funny with a new showrunner. I believe they brought in, I think I read that they brought in a guy named Ben Wexler who worked on that wretched FX show, The Comedians. Which isn't necessarily a reflection on him, but that wasn't. I have no, that wasn't. Really I haven't a, seen that, so I, it's yeah. wretched. Is Brian's word. <laughs> um. Anyway, so we shifted showrunners, but um, let's just kind of run down yeah, what so maybe, makes this funny. Maybe I mean, things will change, but I have really, really enjoyed these first four episodes. I was worried after the first one that, um, that I would fade on it because all the funniest parts were from guest star Kumal Nanjiani. Right. Yeah. From Silicon Valley right. among other things. Um, but really the show has been consistent and funny week after week. And why, why do you think it works? Um, I have a few reasons. Honestly, but... honestly, I think that whoever is responsible for putting these jokes into these actors mouths is one reason, because for whatever reason, the third episode, I think so far has been my favorite. I just, I watched it, it was like a perfect breezy 20 minutes, and I laughed a lot at pretty much any everything that anybody said. And I think that the actors on the show just deliver what they're given, like, so perfectly. Like, Fred Savage and Rob Lowe, I think, are terrific, like, playing off one another. And... The premise is very, like, 90s, like, doesn't make sense, like, completely ridiculous, like, this would never be able to happen in real life, but you don't really right. care, because everyone keeps commenting on the show that it would never for, happen. For those who aren't familiar, Rob Lowe plays a, a, an actor who was a lawyer on a television show called, called, the, called Grinder. the Grinder, right. for <laughs> several years at least, I'm assuming, um, and it's basically... a a really dramatized version of, you know, being a lawyer. Like, it's like a John Grisham TV mm -hmm. show, basically. Right. Um, and he comes home after the show ends to his brother, Fred Savage, 
who is an actual lawyer mm -hmm. with no charisma, <laughs> and he wants to be a real lawyer, effectively, um, and Fred Savage and everyone else is, well, most everyone else, actually, the truth is, Fred Savage is really the only one who's like, this is ridiculous, and right. everyone else is like, it's the grinder, right. he can do it. They're like, it's Dean Sanderson, or whatever his name is, he can do whatever, we would love to have him represent us. But the show is, like, really funny, in the way it's that really it funny. approaches... Like, episodes that have sort of been done before mm -hmm. by a lot of sitcoms, but it somehow kind of gives a fresh, like, take it on it. Feel, I don't know it if it does it's... feel weirdly fresh for some reason. I'm not really sure why, but... Right, like, the second episode, I think they even commented at the beginning. Right, like, there's this meta thing, yeah. They're like, oh, second episodes are the hardest, and, like, um, like where do you even go from here? Like, whatever. It's kind of entertaining because um, each episode kind of begins with... With Dean Roblo's character showing his nephew Fred Savage's kid like episodes of The Grinder, and then the opening scene is usually them watching like the last scene of whatever episode they're on, and then commenting right. on commenting on how the episode goes. So in that second episode, they have this really funny like meta joke where they're like, "All right, we're gonna watch episode two. And like, well, episode two is like the hardest one to get right, and it's <laughs> the second episode of the actual Fox show, The Grinder. So, so I thought that was like a clever touch. Right, and I think the the way that a lot of the meta-ness of it is able to work is because of that weird show within a show thing right. that they have, and Rob Lowe being kind of an idiot. Yes. Um, like, there's just a lot of really funny stuff that Rob Lowe gets to do, mm -hmm. and um, comments that you wouldn't really be able to make. They're like Abed from Community type comments mm -hmm. that you couldn't normally make and have be funny, like... There's a girl who he's interested in who basically has no interest in him. And every time she, like, leaves the room, he'll always just be like... And the budding romance continues. And then, like... he Like, it's something that you believe that his character would say. Right. And it's also, like, commenting on the fact that a lot of shows just let that kind of storyline happen. Right. Um, and they're not really letting it happen yet. I don't know if they will. Right. But it would definitely be funnier if they never let it happen. Yeah. Um, but anyway, like, it's kind of that smartness that makes this show work. Um, because there's also a lot of things that many sitcoms would avoid just to keep a joke going. Like, last week was about um, Fred Savage. I don't remember his name on the show, actually. Neither but do I. Him, his wife and, and him becoming friends with some rich people in the neighborhood. And right. they're, they're worried that the people just want to be friends with them because they want to be friends with Dean. And the reason that the storyline kind of worked for me was because they were aware that the people might be using them. And I, I feel like I've seen enough sitcoms where if they were trying to do that storyline, they wouldn't realize until the very end that the people were trying to use them. You know what I mean? Right. Like... <clears throat> The characters are just smart, and instead of those scenes where two people are looking at each other, and you know that one of them, like, should figure something out, but they just can't figure it out. Right. They know, and they're, they're like, smart, normal people. Yeah. And they just say the thing that, that a lot of shows would drag out for weeks. And I think that's what's helpful about it, or what's enjoyable about it. And I don't know how long it can go on or what will happen with this change but I've really liked it. It's just been sharp and funny and um, yeah, I mean, I, I look forward to it. So what is it that you think, because I, I get maybe this is kind of too general, but it seems like this is kind of the only thing left that networks can still do well, is like just a good half hour comedy. Like, most networks well, I shouldn't say most some networks are pretty reliable for this kind of thing. I mean, uh, we've talked, we've mentioned for the past several weeks. In fact, it's, it seems to come up that NBC had that infamous comedy block. Um, you know, Community, um, Parks Rock. and Rec, Thirty Rock, The Office, and they had all these things going at one time, and that was sort of like the gold standard for like network, you know, comedies. And yet, they couldn't get them off the air fast enough, right? Because they weren't the highest-rated comedies. Right. They were just they were the most niche. critically acclaimed. Right. 
So yeah, it seems like I'm not sure why it kind of went the way that it did, but it is very interesting that Fox is sort of... I mean, I have been watching Brooklyn Nine-Nine since the beginning, and I think it's only gotten better. I mean, I think there were definitely weak episodes in the beginning when the show, you know, was in its first season finding itself. But, yeah, I, I it's interesting that of all the shows that premiered this fall in the, the network circle, that the only two that we found worth talking about were Supergirl and The Grinder. That's just really interesting. I mean... It's I, odd. I, it's... Those would not have probably have been what I would expe- have expected. I will say, though, I know you're talking about new shows, but Empire has been my favorite network discovery. Of, <laughs> not like I discovered it, since everyone else in the country already watched it. Right. But, but man, do I really love Empire. We won't talk about that right now. No, but. we'll we'll get into that as we... As we uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, further. it's 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 weird. It's just I'm I'm kind of enjoying it though. It's like a nice, pleasant home for some of these shows. I don't watch Bob's Burgers. We already mentioned that, but that show's funny. People like Bob's it. Bob's Burgers is funny. Um, it's I, like I, that's another show that I just started watching and I haven't seen previous seasons, other than randomly catching some on Netflix. Right. But it's kind of like a Simpsons type right. deal where there's just a family and they own a burger shop and. The jokes are just funny. The jokes are just funny, yeah. yeah. It's a uh, really funny show. They I actually mean, had guest star uh, Nathan Fielder recently, who we talked about last week. Nice. Um, but yeah, that's. <laughs> I guess that's pretty much all we have to say about I mean, yeah, I guess we've talked, we've had like an entire episode devoted to TV comedy, um, but I think it's just interesting that in some cases, maybe particularly with networks, that there's kind of, like, a low bar to clear. Like, you basically just have to be really funny and really entertaining and, like, worth the 18 to 22 minutes to get through it for me to watch it. Um, And that's pretty much it. Like, you could have an off week as long as you're, like, funny most of the time. Um, Right. So I I think think that's the connection between the two shows we talked about today. Um, Is we talk a lot on this podcast about shows being shows that are high quality or like right have like th- deeper themes or meanings or right. whatever but like a lot of people go to TV for comfort and just to be entertained yes. and these two shows were both comforting and entertaining yeah and i sure. just enjoyed them absolutely they fit into a nice just like you can sit you can watch them you could almost half watch them and like get a few good jokes in and like also fold laundry and like do other things around your house as you're watching them. Or you could sit and really enjoy it and, you know, follow it week to week and really be invested. Um, it can kind of work both ways. But, um, yeah, I think um, I, I think The Grinder's funny. I'm looking forward to seeing if it is able to keep up this kind of hot streak of just really funny episodes. I hope so, but I don't know what... Yeah, I don't know what to expect, I don't expect, know how many really. creative changes to expect. So yeah. we'll see what happens. It'll be interesting. So um, maybe we'll revisit that in yeah maybe f- four more weeks. Yeah, give, we'll, give it a little we'll while. Revisit, we'll revisit. We'll see, both we'll of see these shows develops. down the line and see if they're still worth still worth the time. Right. Um, what's going on with the column? You got a column going up next week? There should be one going up next week, and I it my column is now endorsed by the, the famous cast, actors, the cast of Rectify, <laughs> Abigail Spencer. Jay Smith Cameron and Bruce McKinnon. All retweeted it? All tweeted or retweeted my article out, so that should tell you that you should be reading it. <laughs> Read my column. So, ga- so gainswellscene.com? Once the- again, though, I haven't decided what next week's is going to be about, uh-huh. but um, probably the, by the time we record next week, that will be about when it's coming out, so right. um, we'll mention it then, or if you follow For sure. follow me on Twitter but at if you, Gaines Taylor, you'll if know. If you haven't read the first... You've done three, right? Yeah. Three. The first three columns, um, go to GainesvilleScene.com. You can check that out. It's under Hidden in Plain View. And all three columns, like the letter R, I guess. Okay. The first one was Mr. That's Robot. True. The second one was <laughs> Review. And the third one was Rectify. Yeah. So That's a trend. Is there another show with R that I can do? <laughs> mm, Can't think of one. Not that I can think of. Anyway, yeah, so check out my column if you like reading cool stuff. 
And uh, next week, what's going on next week? I, I believe the Project Greenlight movie comes out in the next week, correct? Yeah, we're going to definitely have to watch that. We'll it's going to be Monday the 2nd, and we'll record Tuesday, so we'll so probably have to watch it and then hopefully we'll talk discuss a little that. bit about it. Hopefully we can only spend like five minutes on it, because <laughs> I, I don't have really high expectations for it, but... Who knows? Did you watch Sunday's episode? I did. It was kind of entertaining. They're done shooting. They're done shooting. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm Maybe we'll of, talk yeah. about that next week. Yeah, we can talk about the last couple of episodes of Project Greenlight and then the movie itself um, next week. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head what else is going on in the TV world this week, um, any, other than stuff that's just been going on. Yeah. But, um, I don't know, we'll figure something out, and it'll be it'll be fun. I feel like there was something interesting that I was going to mention. can't think of it now. Who knows? Doesn't matter. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for today. Um... If you go check out go check out Taylor's column, um, we'll have an episode next week. Most likely we'll touch on some Project Greenlight stuff, and we'll find some other things to talk about. Um, we do have um, a new place for you to find these podcasts. We that are is what be, we definitely should mention. We are going to post these on YouTube now, and you can... There are actually We're actually going to have more than just two or three episodes at a time. We're going to have the whole catalog of episodes... Um, they're going to the be up there for you. The seven are all there right now. So if you go to YouTube.com and you just go in the search bar and you type in Foxworthy TV Podcast. That's Fox- F-A-U-X-W-O-R-T-H-Y. Yep, it's a pun on my last name because my last name is Fox but spelled in a weird way. Um, check those out. Um, we're going to be putting some writing up and we're going to be putting some more podcasts up and we're going to kind of try to keep doing this as a project. So... Um, tweet us, give us some feedback. What's your Twitter handle? At Gaines Taylor. Mine is at FoxBJ underscore 88. And we are working on putting the podcast on iTunes for anyone who would like to have it on the go. But I am not as technologically adept as I thought I was. I spent most of Sunday trying to figure out what an RSS feed was. So once we figure that out, that will be a thing. But, uh, yeah, for now... We'll be on YouTube. Check us out. Yep. If you made it this far, you obviously checked us out. Things are happening. (laughs) So uh, uh, please stick with us. We're going to keep trying to do it. And um, we'll see you next week. You guys have a good one.